responsibility goals in WAM proxy, which is pretty much anything POSIX and, and then a few other systems. Um, so, you know, long story short, the decision was made to begin by porting the FreeBSD stack to user land um, to get that done, to get that transparent TCP proxy for a large number of connections um, piece done. And uh, we figured that was a really good platform to, um, to build upon, both for transparent proxies and, and other features that were of interest later. Um, and the main reason we went with the FreeBSD stack is, you know, it's stable, obviously, been developed for a long time, using a lot of mission critical systems. It's very widely used. Um, there's a lot of active uh, development work being done on it today. And of course, the license. Uh, this made it really of you know, wider commercial interest than, say, looking at Linux or something with a, a, a GPL-related license. Um, just to make sure we're on the same page with the, the context here, um, this is one definition of a transparent TCP proxy. So that's one that can, you know, proxy connections between a client and a server and maintain addressing, um, server addressing from the client's point of view and client addressing from the server's point of view. So at, you know, at, at the frame level, you shouldn't be able to tell if there's a proxy involved. Um, you know, one of the easiest to understand motivations for wanting a transparent proxy is, um, <clears throat> you know, you don't, at, if you have a transparent proxy, you don't have to worry about the details of the protocol that you're proxying on top of it. Some protocols, um, we can argue whether they're poorly designed or whatever, but the, the fact is they send as part of their protocol in, addressing information from the server side or client side to the other end. Um, those types of things when you're proxying tend to cause trouble with NAT or any other sort of address translation layers. Um, that's, just, that's just one example. Um, you know, another, another way to look at the utility of this is um, that if you have something that can impersonate the addresses of the servers on the one side of the proxy and the clients on the other side of the proxy, it then becomes easier to think about how you're going to build proxies that handle you know, large numbers of subnetworks. Um, <clears throat> and you know, plug into different, uh, different network addressing schemes. And um, you know, it's easier to think about how you're gonna architect that, that product. So that's a transparent proxy in a nutshell. Uh, by scalable, we simply mean it can do this for a large number of connections with arbitrary addressing. So tens of thousands of connections, hundreds of thousands of connections, maybe you know, some of those connections are coming in on VLANs or nested VLANs, some aren't, different subnets, what have you. So we set the decision to um, import the TCP IP stack from FreeBSD to userland, and the overarching goals were, you know, we're going after scalability clearly. Um, the choice was made to go with a, a non-blocking event-based API. WAM proxy is, is based on an event system, um, and that's also just sort of the way to go if you're looking at, um, you know, scaling to things like handling many, many, many connection contexts. Um, we also looked at you know, scaling out in terms of how do you scale across interfaces? Uh, how do you handle all those connection contexts? And so the, the targets there were you know, to be able to scale through multi-threading within the application using LibUINet and also take advantage of the fact that now that we've got a stack port into the user space, you can run up multi-instance. You know, every every um, application instance that's linked with the library that you boot is its own isolated stack. So you can then architect whatever your application is to take advantage of that. Um, and, and split up your traffic for management that way. So as a library, it has, it's, it's tightly coupled to the application. Um, you know, we want to keep everything in, in process. There's other, there's been other ports of uh, TCP stacks to userland um, that have had slightly different goals and wanted to expose all their functionality as a service to other clients through sockets um, or as some other IPC mechanism. Uh, that none of those um, that I'm aware of really comport with the performance aspect and the scaling aspect that we're going after. So that wasn't um, that wasn't a goal. We we're we're just focused on keeping everything in process. Um, and since we have a callback and an event-based API, you know, there's uh, other opportunities for enhanced functionality or performance. You know, once you're we're not emulating the syscall layer. We're not saying. Um, we're trying to make a, a drop-in replacement library that you could just link an existing application to. What we're going after is something that provides um, functionality you can't get anywhere else, and for that, you're willing to rewrite your application to it. Um, but once you've crossed that river, 
you then have other opportunities for building features that wouldn't be really feasible if you were trying to you know, um, deliver them through something like the uh, existing syscall API between userland and kernel for networking. Uh, on the portability side, you know, the initial target is, is POSIX environments. Um, when we look at re-implementing kernel facilities a little later in userland, that's, that's what we're looking at initially is using POSIX um, to give us you know, portability of FreeBSD, um, Linux, Mac OS, um, and we want to do this in a, in a maintainable way, right? Because <clears throat> um, sort of the, you know, in my point of view, the, the saddest thing that can happen is you do all this exciting stuff, there's this burst of development, and uh, it's, the effort's been organized in such a way that it sort of becomes hopelessly stale and unmaintainable, hard to bring up to speed with a new version of the network stack. Um, and then, you know, that's sort of the death knell for a lot of these types of projects. So definitely wanted to avoid that. Uh, and as I said, we weren't going after uh, providing a drop-in replacement sockets library where you could just you know, relink and it would look like the um, BSD sockets API exactly at the binary level. Um, not even looking at having you know, a set of headers that you can compile against that would give you exactly the same API because there's things we're looking at delivering um, that really just don't fit in that model. And we didn't think there was any value in um, you know, emulating syscalls and you know, getting the exact behavior that you currently get uh, running a user land program using um, the library interface of the kernel network stack, um, getting that to have all the same exact behavior. Um, and I think I also, I already mentioned, you know, we're not interested in, in creating like a daemon process that exposes the user land networking stack services to other processes. Of course, you can write that into your application that it suits, but not a goal for uh, LibUINet to provide natively. So there were some alternatives that were considered um, at the outset. You know, uh, it, was talked, it was talked about um, to maybe start out with something that seemed a little less complex than the FreeBSD code base. Uh, you know, so a lightweight, independent TCP IP stack. Um, there are some out there. So, you know, the problems are that they're lightweight and independent. So you tend to run into issues with them being feature poor, or um, there's a small user base, they're not mature, um, the project, you know, could become implementing features for TCP IP that are already in the FreeBSD stack but weren't there because we went lightweight to begin with, or, you know, we've basically um, hitched ourselves to a, a project that really has small exposure um, and we become the maintainers of it. Uh, you know, the benefit, the huge benefit of going with a stack like FreeBSDs is that we're reusing all of the TCP IP functionality that's already there in the kernel. None of our work has to focus on improving or maintaining that. We're going to build new features on it. We're going to make it available in a slightly different package. But all, all the tremendous engineering effort that's already gone into um, having a modern, full-featured stack is reusable to us. Uh, there was another project called LibPlebNet. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. I've only ever seen it in print. Uh, that was the user land port of an 8-series stack uh, that had slightly different goals, like having a daemon service to export networking to you know, fully emulate the syscall API, things we weren't interested in. Um, it was apparently a, a abandoned you know, when I found it. I hadn't seen, I haven't seen any new development on it in several years, but parts of it were, uh, were used to seed the LibUINet port. It actually served as a pretty decent roadmap for what facilities would have to be re-implemented, what kernel facilities would have to be re-implemented re in the user space uh, to support the stack. Um, there's also the rump kernel, uh, which is a NetBSD, uh, project. Um, you know, it's a framework for running NetBSD kernel components in user land, including the stack, but it's not focused on just the stack. It also includes file systems uh, and other kernel components. It has slightly different API goals. Um, on paper, when you list kind of the, the things you're at, we were after with LibUINet, there's a lot of overlap, but when we looked at it, it was, um, you know, it seemed like it was going to need non-trivial work anyway. Uh, and since it was, you know, had a lot of uh, aspects to its framework that really weren't relevant to LibUINet, we figured, well, we'll put that non-trivial adaptation effort into um, something based on the FreeBSD stack instead and get something that's really tailored to our goals. Uh, so the, the approach to, to porting the stack was, of course, to re-implement what kernel facilities we needed. Um, this is a similar you know, approach that would be taken by any other of the uh, efforts you'll find, like even the rump kernel um, that are out there. And what the idea is, uh, you know, the kernel facilities like threading, memory allocation, um, <clears throat> locking, 
get re-implemented, you have the same API, you have a user land implementation underneath, then we can reuse the network code untouched until we get to the point where we're adding new features to it. Um, because again, we're trying to leverage as much as possible uh, all, all of the you know, wisdom and hard won experience and effort that's gone into the, the stack as it is today um, for LibUINet. Uh, you know, another one of the goals was whatever new features we put in should be able to completely disappear from the source base by turning off an if def. We want to at any point be able to say, I'm compiling the stock kernel stack by saying, you know, by, by not defining uh, a, you know, a set of guard defines that wrap all the new feature code that we've introduced. Um, and we want to target uh, some of these features so that it can actually be used inside the kernel. That doesn't necessarily serve directly the goals, um, the initial motivations of bringing the stack to user land, but as we're implementing some of the new functionality, uh, it's clear that there could be a use case for having those built into the kernel directly. Um, so I kept that in mind uh, as I went and tried to you know, introduce as few new interfaces between the application and, and the stack as possible to get the job done. And uh, you know, I made it possible to include LibUINet and free, FreeBSD base, uh, just in terms of how I structured the port, trying to do all the you know, user land support work to the side of the kernel source tree, even within my project structure, um, for no other reason than to make it possible to perhaps one day ship you know, LibUINet with FreeBSD base. So as you can see, the source structure um, has all the kernel sources under the sys directory in the project. You know, if you go to uh, the Git, current GitHub location for LibUINet, this is what you'll find. Under sys subdirectory is all the subtrees that contain files needed by LibUINet. Um, not all the files that you'll find in there under the project are actually needed, but the approach taken was to pull in whole subtrees to make merging future versions easier. So instead of cherry picking files out of directories, um, out of kernel directories for LibUINet, we've just uh, imported whole subtrees just to make the merge, merge to uh, later releases of the stack a bit easier. Um, under the lib directory in the project, LibUINet contains all the user land re-implementations of the kernel facilities, the UINet API, any other support code that's part of the library. Anything else you find in the lib directory is, uh, is application support code or um, just support for some of the example programs. Uh, probably the most interesting thing in there is uh, a fork of libEV, which um, is an event system uh, that's, that's been around for a while and is uh, pretty highly performant and widely used. And um, that fork contains a, a, a new watcher type, so you can combine the event loop, um, you know, access to kernel sockets, you know, in the host OS, as well as UINet sockets, as well as timers and whatever else the event system um, gives you access to. And then bin has all the sample programs for, for exercising functionality. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff. So here are the layers, uh, mostly. You know, it's hard to draw these diagrams and, and really show every single relationship between the subcomponents. So, um, you know, you can be pedantic and say I'm, I'm missing something here for sure. But I think I've captured all, all, the, all the major relationships here. So at the top of the stack is the UINN API. So that's what applications written using this library will use. Um, there's a couple things going on there. One is, um, you know, of course, we're, we're building API entry points to give you access to the, the features of interest um, that are available inside the uh, networking stack. But one of the other big um, purposes of, of the API and the way it's built is to give you a clean namespace, right? Because we want this to be portable to, um, you know, to be used in applications and other operating systems. Uh, we also want to be able to have a different version of the FreeBSD TCP IP stack inside the UI net than perhaps is on the host operating system. So just um, you know, using the user land networking API headers for um, you know, constants, uh, structure definitions, that sort of thing, uh, is, is sort of a non-starter because you know, if, you, if you take that API and then bring it over to Linux or take it over to Mac OS, um, you know, things aren't gonna build because um, although there's a lot of similarity in different implementations of the BSD sockets API and the associated constants and structures, uh, they're not identical everywhere. So, you know, one of the things that's going on in the API is, is just namespace laundry, just giving you a clean, um, generic version that um, comports with what's inside the library of all those constant structures uh, and entry points. So that API, though, is built on top of kernel sockets. 
And you know, the, the goal here is to integrate with an event system um, of one sort or another. So uh, our main focus was on non-blocking sockets and um, you know, running things in an event-based manner. So the kernel sockets API, you know, I didn't have to go any further than that, right? Because you can run kernel sockets non-blocking and you have up calls, um, which are sort of a bare bones, you know, event interface for, uh, for kernel sockets. So um, that's pretty much everything that you'll find in, in UIPC sockets.c in the stack, uh, in that kernel sockets layer that we're using. Um, the, only, the only difference I would say is that we've also pulled in some code from the uh, UIPC syscalls. Um, in particular for accept, if you look at like SO accept in the kernel, it's, it's uh, really bare bones. Um, it does a really minimal amount of work. If you look at current accept, that's handling the syscall, it's handling you know, taking new sockets off the queue um, and doing some other error checks and, uh, and housekeeping details that you really need to get done anytime you're accepting a new socket. So you know, what's the UN API is pretty much kernel sockets exactly with some amount of um, the kernel side of the syscall interface just you know, with file descriptors removed because we're completely um, have avoided file descriptors here. Uh, so below that, the net plus net inet, that's the stack, right? So that's just my shorthand for everything in the TCP IP stack. So that's just kernel sources. We'll see in the next slide, I'll show you where everything comes from, what's been re-implemented. Re and then on down, we've got you know, relevant um, kernel facilities that we need to make that all float. Uh, these little legs up here are just showing that there's some things outside of the kernel sockets API that show up on the API for the application. There's some, you know, like network interface configuration entry points that, that get exposed to the API, and um, there's currently access to the UMA zone allocator through the API, so applications can access, you know, the, those pool allocators if they wish. Um, underneath all those kernel facilities is something called the UINet host interface. So that's an abstraction layer that's going between those um, re-implemented or partially re-implemented re -implemented, uh, user land versions of those kernel facilities um, that's serving two purposes. One is um, it's giving us a, you know, a portability. So you know, if we, even using POSIX threading, um, <clears throat> and you know, POSIX locks, and you know, standard C library routines to re-implement some of these kernel interfaces, there are inter-platform differences. Um, and we also have a similar, a similar issue there with namespace. You know, everything in the, in the UINet host interface is being called into from like kernel code context. I have a, another slide where we'll, we'll highlight this in detail, but you know, it's, we can't have the P threads header like pulled into a file that's also got the kernel K threads header in kernel mode um, because in general, you're just gonna have namespace collisions, right? Just, it's just not buildable. Um, it's the architecturally wrong thing to do. So one thing that gets, gets done in the, in the UNet host interface is another namespace um, cleansing process. Every symbol and constant used in the interface is just completely based on basic uh, C types um, and doesn't, doesn't pull any baggage from the host, host OS. Uh, the remaining piece here is on the left, the new packet interfaces. So. Once we've got this user land stack, we've got an API of the application to talk to it. The question is where are the packets coming in and out? Uh, so there's a set of, of pack interfaces that are just interfaces of IFNet, just like they would be in the kernel, except they're tying into other things that are available to user land. So for example, you can have a, a packet interface that's talking to NetMap, and then you can access anything that NetMap can access for, for packet IO. You can talk to PCAP, you can talk to DPDK, you can talk to Unix kernel domain socket, Clay tablets, I mean, whatever uh, suits the application. Um, if there isn't in a packet interface that suits, uh, it's a pretty straightforward exercise to write one. Um, right, so here's, this shows uh, where the sources for all these things are coming from. Um, that nice shade of FreeBSD red is unmodified kernel code. Uh, everything in blue is showing things that are created new, entirely new for LibUINet. And this is uh, my attempt at a purple that's halfway um, between that red and blue. And those are all the kernel facilities. And what you'll find if you look in there is 
um, depending on the facility and the, you know, the subroutine in that facility, there's either been a wholesale re-implementation, there's been um, you know, a copy, essentially a copy made of what's in the kernel with some slight modifications, um, or in some cases almost entire reuse of, of the kernel code because some of these facilities are built on top of exclusively other existing kernel facilities. So once we've ported the other ones, um, we get those, those other kernel facilities for free. Um, <clears throat> All right, this is just a summary of the namespace issues I was talking about. In terms, you know, from a development standpoint, you know, when you're working in any of these layers, you, ha you have to keep in mind what environment you're really in. You know, you're technically all, you know, writing user land code, except that the, um, the build environment for everything here in red is the same as if you were writing kernel code. Because we're all, everything in the, underneath the UNet API is, is written as if it was written in the kernel because you're talking to the kernel sockets API, you're talking to the kernel networking stack, you're talking to kernel facilities, and then on down. Uh, if you're coding inside the UINet host interface, that's a, um, a host OS environment. All the code you write in there is like a normal user land program. You've got pthreads, C library, um, everything at your disposal. You'll see the packet interfaces are you know, typically split between the two because they have to and implement an IFNet interface you have to interact with the kernel facilities, but to get your packets in and out, you're in, at the end of the day plugging into some host OS facility, whether it be a NetMap or a Unix domain socket um, or something else. So what you'll find you know, in, in the typical IFNet implementation is the, the driver split into two separate files. One is built in a, in a kernel <coughs> environment and one is built in the host environment. And then there's a, an API, a clean API, um, that doesn't have any external dependencies for symbol definitions uh, that goes between the kernel and host parts. Um, and, and also there's, you know, there's things that go into the, the host side of one of these um, packet drivers that could be pulled into the UNet host interface if they're generic enough. Sometimes they're just driver specific and they live in there. The character of everything that, that falls in here inside one of these drivers is exactly the same as the character in there. Um, and in some cases it's just sort of a a discre you know, dis purely discretionary call as to whether a routine can be found in, say, the host portion of a NetMap driver or whether it was pulled into the more general UHI. Um, the UHI itself, of course, can be used anywhere because it has a completely uh, generic interface. It's not dependent on any host or kernel headers. Um, <clears throat> in general, though, if you're inside kernel code, uh, you use a kernel facility first um, and only use UHI uh, interface if you have another option. You know, an example of that would be, you know, you're writing new, um, a new feature inside the kernel part of LibUINet and you need a thread. You could call the UHI, you know, create thread interface, which would work, um, but the more proper thing to do is call the kthread interface, which is using UHI underneath because uh, the kthread interface is doing additional things um, to keep that thread uh, you know, properly initialized and organized within the, you know, kthread um, kernel context that wouldn't be happening uh, just by calling the UI net, uh, you know, thread create routine. All right, so as I've said, the API itself is intended for, um, for use in non-blocking event-driven applications. Uh, you, you get pretty much, just by virtue of the fact that it's based on the kernel sockets interface, you get um, blocking support um, almost by default because it's already there. But uh, there's currently no way to wait on groups of sockets in this implementation um, because we've completely done, with, done away with file descriptors. We're not emulating file descriptors. Uh, a UINet socket is really just an opaque pointer to a socket structure. It's not wrapped in anything else. Uh, so there's no, um, and because we're only in, interested initially in event-driven applications, there's been no um, facility equivalent to like poll or select implemented for UNit sockets. So, I mean, you know, it's a direction that could be, could be gone into, but it's just not on the, um, on the direct roadmap for the UNit right now. <clears throat> so, um, the, initial, the initial goal of the API was to integrate with WAN, WAN proxy, right? Because that's where the whole project started. WAN proxy has its own event system, um, so the, the API was tailored where necessary 
to interact with that. But the idea is that we provide enough tools to, um, in general, integrate it with any event system. Uh, we're trying to capture uh, generically what's required for integration with event systems. I, I, think, um, I think I've done it um, because we've integrated not only with WAN proxy, but also with LibEV. And, and they're just two, you know, they're both event systems, but the integrations, um, they just look very different. You know, there's a number of, there's a number of details that, that can differ uh, in the impl implementation of event systems that have different requirements they place on things like a library that provides, you know, non-blocking sockets and, and uh, you know, a callback-based interface for events. And um, I think between these two integrations that have been completed so far, uh, we, have a, we have a pretty general um, interface. You know, if we want to uh, integrate with another event system that was application specific for another another project or um, was, you know, lib event or one of the other extant um, event systems, uh, I think we have all the tools in place already to do it. Um, you know, one of the motivations for, for integrating with libEV was that um, although we expose you know, the kernel, essentially all the kernel sockets API functionality, which includes non-blocking sockets and up calls, and you can write your application directly to it. Um, I think most people will be happier, you know, not having to do that because the, the kernel up calls um, mechanism has, a, has a, quite a bit of a learning curve to it. And there's a, there's a common hazard involved that um, involves the fact that kernel up calls are, are invoked you know, kernel up call is a callback that you can attach to a socket and say, you know, when there's read activity, call this function. When there's write activity, call this function. Those functions are called with the, the lock on the sock buffer inside the socket held. And typically what you want to do in integrating with your application through one of these callbacks um, is uh, inside that callback routine that you've supplied, you'll grab some other application specific lock, right, to then do something in your application under that lock. Uh, and then what typically happens is there's some other part of the application that wants to hold that lock while doing some sort of socket operation. Well, the socket operation is going to grab the sock buff lock to do its work. And you have a lock order reversal then. Because when the up calls are called, you've got sock buff lock, then your application lock. When uh, somewhere else in your application, you lock your application lock, then call into an API routine, you've got the locks being acquired in reverse order. Uh, there's usually a way around that, but what seems to happen is um, it's common for the, you know, the initial implementation of, of trying to integrate with up calls to run into the lock order reversal problem and then have to solve it. And then you find out when you solve it, what you're really doing is writing an event system because you're like, oh, I have to queue these event notifications to some other thread or context and then deal with them with the right you know, locking order. Okay, you're starting to write an event system. So why not just provide uh, integration with a you know, widely known and used event system? So you can hit the ground running and not have to worry about details like that. Um, there's currently two, two packet interface implementations um, in, the, in the source base. One is for NetMap. Uh, it, was, it was written to an earlier version than current. Um, so it does zero copy on receive up to some fraction of the available ring buffers. So uh, when it's feeding packets to the bottom of the TCP IP stack, yeah, you'll do that zero copy up until um, one half or three quarter or some fraction that you can choose of the uh, ring, NetMap ring buffers are outstanding to the stack. And once you pass that threshold, it'll start doing copies so that you don't wind up using all the, the ring buffers up, handing them all to the stack. The stack hangs on to them, and now you've stalled your receive uh, path. Um, <clears throat> so I say you know, it, it builds with the current NetMap. But it's not yet taking advantage of some of the, the more recent features, uh, which are the ability to expand the number of um, receive buffers beyond the ring size for the adapter. Uh, that gives us um, a much wider zone where we can stay in zero copy um, receive mode when feeding packets to the stack. And there's also functionality on the transmit side that allow us to do um, zero copy coming from the stack. Currently, everything coming out on the transmit side um, is copied you know, from an MBuff into a, a ring buffer in NetMap and then sent. Um, but the, you know, the functionality is currently there in NetMap. I just have to update that, that pack interface to use it, and we'll see some increased performance on, on, on that, uh, that pack interface. There's also a PCAP interface, um, which I've used less widely. I've mainly used it for feeding PCAP files to the stack for testing. It's a really handy feature to have um, because you can 
you can can a capture and then feed it to the stack to develop a new feature, reproduce a bug, et cetera. Um, of course, you can also use it to deal with non, you know, to deal with uh, real network interfaces, not just PCAP files. So it's useful for doing uh, portability work um, to operating systems that don't currently, you know, have NetMap support, say Mac OS. Um, but packet interfaces in general could be anything. You just have to put an IFNet, um, you know, interface on the top of it. And what's underneath, I mean, it could literally be anything. Um, it's not a comprehensive list. So there's a couple of, um, I'd say, major ocean, open issues with the port so far. Uh, one is with uh, locking. Um, there are, you know, there's a pretty diverse set of locking um, primitives in the kernel. Right, that have different semantics and different behavior in, in certain circumstances. Um, in user land, going with POSIX, uh, we've got a much smaller set of primitives, um, and in some cases, the behavior differs. I think the, the one of the most relevant um, issues in this port has to do with read-write locks, because right now, everything in libuinet for re-implementation of, of kernel lock facilities are mutexes. Um, you know, they're POSIX mutexes. They're either configured for, you know, recursive operation or not, depending on what the, you know, remapped kernel call was really asking for. But there's not a real re read-write lock. So, you know, right now the built-in expectation is there's a lot bigger chance for lock contention um, in, in LibUINet than, you know, you'd find in the kernel for, you know, similar traffic flow through the stack. Um, you know, one of the issues with the, pthread interface is that while they have a read-write lock, um, it doesn't support the recursion semantics that are defined for the um, FreeBSD kernel read-write lock. And um, some, you know, the, the recursion behavior that's not supported by pthreads is, um, is an optional feature of the, the kernel um, RW lock interface. But the locks of interest, like the NPCB locks that are used for managing connection context in the stack, want to use that recursive behavior. So something has to be done there. It remains you know, on the to-do list to, um, to build something. It might be possible to build something around the pthreads RW lock, but it might have to, um, to build something you know, from mutexes and, and queues and things. Uh, PCPU is a kernel facility for um, uh, per CPU data, right? There's a number of optimizations in the kernel today that use pCPU. The whole point is that you can keep context on a per CPU basis. And so, um, you know, components of the kernel can be implemented to, to cache things or maintain state on a per CPU basis. So um, when you're trying to access a certain facility, like, you know, allocate memory or um, allocate memory in, you know, UMA zone allocator or, um, do uh, packet processing work through NetISR, that you can keep that processing or context you know, on, on a, a given CPU and take advantage of you know, warm cache effects. Or you can avoid, um, you can keep, zone, you know, for the memory allocator, you can keep uh, local caches of, of objects that are per CPU, so wherever the allocation happens, it can try and allocate it out of the local cache first and not have to grab a lock that might be contended across CPUs, which is a, an expensive operation. Um, in general, you know, what PCPU is providing and how it's used in the kernel is of value and it's something we want to be able to, to take advantage of in LibUINet. Um, but we, we really can't currently. Uh, there's more work to be done there. But part of the issue is there's no user land way to disable preemption. You know, in the kernel there's two routines called uh, critical enter and critical exit, right? And those are really inexpensive ways to, to keep a, a currently running thread from being preempted on whatever CPU it's running on. There's just no user land equivalent. Um, some of the, it's, that's not required for all the uses of, of the PCPU infrastructure in kernel code, but it is for some important ones like the UMA zone allocator. Um, it uses critical enter and critical exit to protect access to its per CPU cache of um, zone objects. So, you know, currently, you know, you could, you could emulate that by saying, okay, critical enter and exit are going to be a mutex, but now you're sort of defeating the purpose. You know, the, the per CPU caching and, and um, preemption disable going on the kernel is in part done to prevent acquiring mutexes and containing on mutexes across processors, right? So that's not really a, a reasonable way to, to emulate it and expect uh, performance. And although it hasn't, um, 
we'll talk a little bit more about, a little bit more about performance later. Um, it's certainly clear that some of the PC, PCP optimizations um, you know, aren't able to deliver their intended benefits in the, with the current state of the port as it is. Uh, but I think it's actually worse in some cases where they become pessimizations. Like I said, the, the UMA zone allocator is heavily used throughout the stack. You have a question? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Right, because, well, really, right, so there's, there's, there's two things that we can do, in, I think. Let me back up. In thinking about this problem, um, there's different approaches that may not 100% give you what PCPU does in the kernel, right? But it can still get the, the benefits or some, some portion of the benefits that it's trying to provide, right, you, using the same infrastructure. And the suggestion of saying, well, if what we're really trying to do is keep threads from contending with each other for the same resources across CPUs, right? So we don't have to quite literally keep everything on a per CPU basis, right? We can, we can keep, um, we can reduce inter-thread contention for resources by having per thread resources instead of per CPU. And that's what the, the bullet item is saying, oh, can we make, you know, make things per thread instead of per CPU? You know, an example that many people might be familiar with is the way uh, J.E. Malik uses arenas for its allocation. Right, so that's, that's certainly one, one idea and might, you know, might be an answer or the answer here. Um, another way to look at it is using thread pinning. Um, you know, that's currently how things are you know, in the functional port that's done today. Um, it will work better when you have threads pinned than not. So the, the way that currently works is um, <clears throat> if your thread is pinned to a CPU, it'll access any of these per CPU um, accesses will go to the context for the CPU that that thread is pinned to. Um, if, if the active set um, or the CPU set for a thread doesn't have a single CPU in it, in other words, you're not pinned to a single CPU, it'll just go to context zero. So it's kind of like anything you haven't explicitly pinned will all, will all fight for the same PCPU context, context zero. But if you start pinning your threads, um, all the accesses to PCPU data will go to a CPU-specific uh, location that corresponds to the CPU that you're pinned to. Um, so that's another way to kind of, you know, you're getting some, some slice of the functionality, but you're not getting the full, you know, the, the, full, um, the full benefit. And that's, you know, the, the, anal the analogy there for the thread pinning approach would actually be the way that NetISR uses, actually currently uses PCPU stuff. Because NetISR is really a pool of threads where, pool of worker threads with each one pinned to a CPU. And it uses, um, it uses PCPU data you know, in that way, because it's, it's accessing that data from inside of a worker thread. Um, and it relies on the fact that it's already pinned. Um, okay, so now uh, onto the extras. So the, the first, um, new feature work that was done once we had the, the stack ported to user land and functioning and delivering um, all of its existing functionality, you know, TCP, um, UDP access, anything that works in the stack um, in kernel after the port works in user land. Um, there's some things we haven't tried yet, like we haven't stood up SCTP support, so there's probably some, um, some corner, corner cases in the, um, in the kernel abstraction, you know, re-implementations that we need to fix. But in general, you know, we're using the whole kernel source unmodified. We provide all the facilities. Everything that works in the stack in the kernel should work in user land. Uh, we just most heavily exercise the TCP part of it. But the first, uh, the first new bit of functionality is, is aimed at the original motivating case, which is building transparent proxies that can handle large number of connections, that can handle um, a huge diversity in addressing across those, um, those connections and also handle you know, lots and lots of VLANs in that diversity of addressing. So the promiscuous sockets term is, is what I'm using to describe uh, the ability to set up a listen socket that has a lot more control than usual over what kind of connections it'll capture. By capture, I mean if it sees a SIN come in, it'll, say, it'll match that SIN and say, 
that's a connection for me. It'll do the three-way handshake and establish the connection with the client. So a promiscuous socket allows you to listen um, on any IP address, any port, any VLAN tag stack. And when I say any VLAN tag stack, you can specify, I'm only gonna match connections that have you know, this many levels of, of VLAN tag stack with these specific tags in each level. You can say, I wanna capture connections that match all the other criteria on any VLAN, or you can say, I wanna insist that there's no VLAN tags. I only wanna match untagged um, traffic. <clears throat> and you can wildcard on any of them. So you can say uh, any combination of, like I said, listen on specific VLAN or any VLAN or no VLAN. You can say I want to listen on a specific IP or any IP. You can say I want to listen on a specific port or I want to listen on any port. And all the combinations um, are supported. So you can really go from very targeted listens to wide open, you know, I'm going to create a connection, do a three-way handshake for any SIN that reaches this interface. Um, <clears throat> by the way, if you're, I'll just make a quick side note, if you're actually uh, building something that is going to respond to every SIN that reaches it, you should think carefully about the network that you're plugged into. <laughs> because even, even on switch networks, right, address table misses will cause SINs going between two other endpoints that are unrelated to your network segment to show up on your interface. Um, that's something I became aware of early in development when all my X terminals disappeared. Um, <clears throat> so that's on the, on the listen side. On the active side, um, promiscuous sockets give you control over your personality on the network. So you can say, um, all, the, all the frames that I send are gonna have this VLAN tag stack, uh, this source and des destination MAC address, this source um, IP and source port. Um, of course, the destination is controlled through bind, so there's nothing new there. Um, <clears throat> So that's promiscuous sockets, it's those specific pieces of functionality plus any supporting infrastructure for that. Um, the supporting infrastructure includes uh, an ability to bypass routing on network, um, on network interfaces on input and output. We'll talk about why that's interesting a little later. Uh, that's, that's done using something called connection domains, uh, another invented term, abbreviated CDOMs. We'll, we'll talk more about those. Um, there's new interface mode for uh, implementations of of uh, network interfaces for the drivers that um, provide additional handling of L2 info. I mean, normally that stuff is stripped off the packets after it's passed up you know, from the ethernet layer to a higher layer. But some of these functions, um, like having control, and you'll see later we want to have um, access to L2 info at a higher level in the stack, at the socket level, you know, requires preserving some of that information. Um, and also some of the steering for connection domains gets, gets handled by that mode. Uh, and then finally, uh, something called SIN filters. Um, and that's an ability to you know, uh, do some analysis on each arriving SIN packet to decide how you want to handle it, whether you want to feed it to the stack or not. And I'll, of course, go into detail on that. So uh, connection domains are really a way to, um, to, map, um, to map connection handling TCP IP socket behavior to physical ports in the machine. Well, I say two network interfaces. Ne these network interfaces, I'm talking about in the stack, of course, it's a virtualized concept. It may or may not map to physical ports in the machine depending on what kind of packet interface you're using and what your architecture is. But you know, nor normally on packet output, um, there's gonna be a routing lookup that's gonna decide which interface to send to. Um, connection domains is a way to bypass that to say that, you know, to set everything up so that um, you can say all traffic sent from this socket is going to go out through this network interface all the time. Um, that fits, that kind of behavior fits architecturally some of the use cases um, for this uh, stack enhancement. Uh, but it's also something that's desirable from the standpoint of, you know, if you weren't originally architecting things that way, but you want to handle, you know, hundreds of thousands or more simultaneous connections, you know, you need to start considering whether you really want to feed all that stuff through the routing infrastructure for performance and scalability reasons. Um, because a lot of times, it seems to me, at least from my perspective of how this is being used, uh, you know, the routing infrastructure isn't actually necessary. So it's, you know, it didn't make sense to feed everything through there, even though it would, quote, work, because we'd have these huge, um, you know, if you've, if you've got 100,000 sockets that are all, um, you know, all, that will all wind up, you know, there's a diversity of addressing such that they basically all wind up with their own individual routes. You've got 100,000 routes in the box. Um, 
but your architecture might be that all the traffic is coming in these two interfaces and going out those two interfaces. There's no purpose for doing all that. Um, so that's, that's one of the motivations for, for this whole connection domain approach. Um, so the way it works is uh, every packet interface belongs to a connection domain. All established connection contexts in PCBs in the kernel, um, you can think of that roughly as equivalent to being a socket. They all belong to a connection domain. Um, on receipt of a packet, it's, that packet is tagged with a connection domain depending on the interface. It just inherits uh, the connection domain of whatever interface it, it arrived on. Um, <clears throat> and a given received packet can only match a connection contact within its connection domain. So that, that's where the whole term comes from. So when that packet's received, um, it makes it up to, you know, it's a TCP IP packet and it makes it up through the IP layer. The first thing that's done is uh, a lookup is performed to figure out what sh which existing connection, if any, that packet matches. Is it something of interest that should be processed further by the stack? Um, connection domains are, are a way to segment um, the scope of that matching. So instead of matching against all connections that are present in that entire instance of LibUINet, associating um, interfaces with the connection domain gives you the ability to have um, an independent pool of connection context uh, when it comes to matching. And that lets you do things like build a box that can be connected to um, multiple fully independent networks that may be using the same addressing. Um, all right, apparently I'll speed things up here. Uh, that's something you, know, you, can't, you can't currently do very easily uh, without promiscuous sockets. So the way this, the way this shakes out is um, CDOM0 is the default. If you don't configure anything, everything will be in CDOM0. Um, it's special from the, from the standpoint of connection domains, but really it's the default behavior of the stack. You can have multiple interfaces in CDOM0. Outbound packets in CDOM0 are actually routed. Um, they don't go through this you know, fixed interface uh, transmit path. Um, and all the you know, CDOM, non-zero CDOMs are what are used for promiscuous sockets. So when you create a promiscuous socket, you assign it a CDOM, and you know, that basically uh, identifies which, interface, which packet interface in the system that socket is going to handle traffic for. And as I said before, once you do that, no outbound packets are, are passed through the routing infrastructure. They always go to that interface. Um, so for, for people familiar with the you know, internals, a lot of this, a lot of these characteristics um, and maintaining these properties for interfaces, connection contexts, um, you know, in PCBs is already in place in the form of the, the FIB numbers, FIB number properties that are in there. So we leverage that plumbing um, in the implementation to, to make CDOMs work. <clears throat> so this is just a, a quick sketch of what I'm talking about. You can see in CDOM zero is a normal case these green rectangles are, represent a, a connection. You can think of it like a socket. You know, inbound traffic from the interface comes into connection lookup, gets mapped to a connection on input. Anything coming outbound goes through the routing infrastructure and then gets shunted out to the proper interface. Um, for non-zero CDOMs, it's much simpler. All inbound stuff goes through lookup, uh, but only for that, only within that connection domain and everything outbound always maps to a single interface. Uh, I mentioned there's a, you know, a, a new interface mode that works in concert with promiscuous sockets. There's a new flag, you know, IFF promiscuinet, that when set on the interface causes the VLAN tag stacks to be removed. Um, it, it supports arbitrary, I mean, up to some defined constant. Um, I think it's currently 16, which is, I think, not necessary. Um, in, in terms of it'll handle anything you'll see in the wild. <clears throat> but it'll remove the tag stack and remove the MAC addresses and save them an mbuf tag on the packet. So that will be available for analysis at any other layer in the network stack up to and including um, the SYN filter. So SYN filter is something uh, you can install on a promiscuous listen socket that will get called for, it's a callback that'll get invoked for every SYN that arrives that matches that socket's criteria. Uh, it's a way, it's, it provides two main pieces of functionality. One, it allows you to do more complex matching than is possible with just the, um, you know, specific or wildcard ability of the individual fields of the promiscuous listen. So you can look for, you know, complex subsets of VLANs or IP addresses or ports um, using a SYN filter. The SYN filter will get called on the SYN packet. You then return a status that says, 
yet accept this and pass it through the existing machinery, um, you know, reject it silently, reject it with a reset, or I'm gonna defer the decision, which is basically saying, hey, don't submit that to the SynCache machinery that already exists. I'm gonna hold it aside and at some later point, I'll resubmit it with, with, the, with the disposition. And that, that last piece of functionality is particularly useful in making well-behaving uh, proxy applications. Right, a couple of things to keep in mind when you're implementing a SYN filter. Um, you, have, you have to take into account the fact that a SYN may arrive, the same SYN may arrive multiple times due to retransmits, especially if you've told the first instance you're gonna defer the decision and it's taking you a while to, to make that decision. You may get another copy from the client in the meantime, so you have to structure your SYN filter implementation accordingly. Um, and nothing in promiscuous sockets or SYN filters defeats the existing functionality or directly defeats or precludes the use of the SYN cache or SYN cookies. They, they both still work um, fully in the way they were intended, except that depending on your implementation of the SYN filter, you can subvert their benefits. You know, if your SYN filter, the first thing it does on, every time it runs is um, allocate a large amount of context to do whatever sort of decision making you're going to do, you've pretty much subverted the point of the SYN cache, which was not to allocate a lot of memory on every SYN that arrives. Right. Um, this shows the, uh, <coughs> the enhanced proxy behavior you can get with a SYN filter. And what this is showing is, you know, normal proxy without a SYN filter is going, these green dots represent connection establishment, right? So normally a client's gonna send a SYN, it's gonna go to the SYN cache, SYN cache will send the SYN ACK. When the final ACK in the handshake arrives from the client, then the socket will be created, you know, it'll be available through accept in the proxy. And then at that point, you say, oh, I've got a new connection from a client in your application. That's your first point of awareness. You then initiate the connection with the server. Um, the problem is, if this part doesn't work out, between here and whenever you've had a timeout or a fin arrived from the server that said this isn't gonna work out, you've had an open connection from the client. Right, the client may be sending you things because it thinks you're the server. Um, you know, architecturally, it's, it's, you know, presents some challenges. Do I, do I queue the data? Do I ignore it? Um, does the client care how fast I respond once the connection is opened, et cetera? With the SYN filter, your SYN filter runs when the SYN comes in. At that point, you can initiate the connection to the server you're proxying to. And when the server responds with its SYN act, then that's when you get connection establishment on your outbound connection, right? And at that point, you can say, ah, that worked out. I'm gonna tell, um, I'm gonna submit my deferred decision for the SYN filter invocation up here, back to the stack, and then that's gonna complete, that's gonna submit it to the SYN cache, which will send the SYN act and complete the connection with the client. If anything happens in here, maybe you got a reset from the server or it timed out, you have no established client connection. The client application hasn't proceeded in any way. Um, your emulated behavior is now exactly what their experience would have been in terms of connection establishment. With, um, it's the same as what would have been if they were connected directly to the server instead of the proxy. Um, yeah, that, that end to end relationship that you maintain. Yeah. Um, have you seen this important in some specific applications? I can see that, you know, in one case, you would have gotten a connection closed. Right. That's, well, that's a different outcome, it's a different error or the same scenario. Well, in this case, in this case, you're not going to, you're saying if the server, if you sent it a sin and it sent you a fin so, in response? For the reset. In the reset. If it sends you a reset, then you actually, you actually know that because you get that status from your connection attempt. You know, you know how the server responded to you. You can distinguish through, you know, you've done a connect call here. And based on the way the connect effort terminates, you can actually distinguish through the normal, without any special, we haven't changed anything, you're able to distinguish whether you got a reset, you got a close, you got a timeout. And then you're able to tell the SYN filter, when you submit this for decision, you can say, reject that SYN silently, which would emulate the timeout. You can say, reject it with a reset, which would emulate a reset. Um, 
I don't think there's, I don't think in the flow here you can get a, anything other than a reset or a timeout in this, so, so in this part of the sequence. Maybe my question wasn't clear. So in the first case, with the sense filter, the proxy without the sense filter, and then and, and mm -hmm. you get a reset on the server, but by the time you get the reset, you would have already established a connection with the client. And so when you get the reset from the server, let's say after you when you send your sense, like the first case, We're talking about this case here. Yeah. yeah. Then, Oh right, yes, exactly. I mean that's 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 part of the benefit of the that's part of the benefit of having the sin filter implementation. Right. In that in that case you can't without the sin filter you can't actually emulate all the behaviors of the server to you back to the client. Right. So, yeah. so that end in famous end to end Um, yeah, I, I say that the actual answer to that is I don't, I don't know the specific real, real world installation example where that, that's the case. Um, all I can tell you is that this was one of the required features when I was approached to do the work. Because I'm, I'm doing this work under a contract and I'm not on the, I don't have exposure to the customer side in this project, right? So I don't have a real world use case. Um, that can tell you, oh, in this installation with this client and this protocol, you know, this makes all the difference. You know, I think that, you know, the way to look at it is, is the main value is um, it allows you, you know, if, if you're talking about inserting a proxy into some situa situation to um, provide some, some sort of behavior, I mean, just look at the point, the point of view of being a startup and creating a new product and saying, you know, I can deliver feature XYZ by proxying all your traffic. Right, and then well, someone can you know, this is just a basic you know product development benefit, right? Someone can nitpick and say, ah, well you know you're changing, you're really getting in, visibly getting in the way between my clients and my servers, you know, and then you have to have an argument. Does that really matter? Like you're saying, web browsers don't care. Well, do they? Um, te technically, this is you know this is transparent, right? But then it never ends, right? Because you have your sequence space that you have to align. Well, that's, you know, that's like how transparent do you want to be? And then there's timing, then there's, you know, it's like, do you want to be invisible? You know, so this is, this is true. This is, this, is, um, this is transparent down to addressing and like, you know, connection establishment details, right? Beyond that, nothing else is being aligned. You know, timing, sequence numbers, all the odd behaviors of stacks that can fingerprint them. I mean, this isn't invisible sockets. It's, you know, um, that's, yeah, it's not the goal. Um, so I think we're one minute over now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I apologize. Um, how about give me two? Give me two more minutes, and I'll wrap it up because this is really, I think, the bulk of the interesting piece. I'll skip the walk through the API, but yeah, the, the flavor here is just that the interface for doing this looks a lot like the interface for um, you know, normal socket operations. I've tried to implement all the functionality through additional socket options as opposed to API calls. That just goes to you know, what if we wanted to use this in kernel as opposed to in user land? Um, that makes that more possible. Uh, just a comment on scalability. The way scalability was handled is that um, at all the connection contexts are still kept in one giant hash, right? So, <clears throat> but everything that comes through the promiscuous sockets, promiscuous interfaces, promiscuous sockets, is hash with a more expensive hash that takes into account VLAN tag stack, source and destination, in order to get good distribution. So if you're handling a million connections, all those connections can be on a million different VLANs and the same IP. They can be on a million different IP and port combinations. You know, you can slice it however you want. Um, you'll still get good hash distribution. You won't get, you know, performance degradation from long chains. And the way it's done is that everything that's in connection domain zero that's not being um, processed in promiscuous mode still uses the existing hashes, the, the smaller, faster hashes. It goes in the same hash table. The lookup path is different because it knows whether it's doing CDOM zero or promiscuous sockets lookups. So you only pay the penalty when you want the promiscuous functionality, but you can still use all the natural stack functionality without additional expense. And this has been tested up to, you know, basically two million sockets in the box. Um, and you know you have you have one million active connections, one million listen connections, addressing. However, 
um, and all those sockets function and you know, pass data correctly. So the, the second feature that was added is a lot simpler to talk about. It's called passive receive. And that's the ability to run TCP, reassembly, and socket operations um, using a copy of a packet stream between two endpoints. So you can be connected to a span port or some other layer in your architecture that delivers a copy of the packet stream. Um, and you can get a pair of sockets that you can read from that'll have the fully reassembled TCP streams um, that are present in the actual connection between those two endpoints that you're monitoring. Uh, we'll have to save the rest of it, I think, for online reading. But one of the, a couple of things to think about before we part ways is when you're doing passive receive, you're not actually participating in the TCP protocol, you're only monitoring it. So if there's any packet loss in the path between you and the packet stream that you're observing, so this is, I mean, if you're using a span port, this is a big problem because span ports are really lossy, at least in the equipment I have access to. Um, even between virtual machines, which is all in memory, they're really lossy. There's no way to get a retransmit from that. You know, the client isn't going to retransmit a packet because you, it went missing to you, the passive receiver, you know, if the other side saw it and acted. it. Uh, so there's additional functionality that's been built in to, to handle the case that there's, um, where there's missing packets, you get holes in the data, you might have missed fins closing connections down. So you, you need support in the MBUF system for whole data, support in the receive function to tell you where whole boundaries are and whether you've had them or not, so your application can give up or continue accordingly. Um, and you also need to have timers to make sure connections don't live indefinitely. You can either use the idle timers that are existing uh, to kill connections after an activity, or the application can have its own timer uh, to handle the case where you miss connection close down. Okay, so API. Um, and really, you know, performance, in terms of time performance instead of scaling performance, we've talked about scaling. Um, we're just really getting into the phase where we're starting to look at time performance. Uh, but, you know, sort of, you know, the quick and dirty tests, if you're doing something like, you know, netcat-like transfer of a large file, um, throughput through the user line stack is currently about 70% of what you get with everything else the same doing it in kernel. Um, so on the one hand, it's not, um, you know, like 10x slower, 2x slower. On the other hand, there's clearly a gap that we have to close, and I think there's, there's some obvious places to look. Um, you know, we talked about locking and PCPU issues earlier that'll count for part of the difference. Um, using the NetMap interface, you know, we'll get some benefit, reduction of packet copies when I bring it up to the current revision of NetMap. Um, and we'll close with, you know, the list of future work. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe the, the most relevant will be the fact that right now, um, for promiscuous sockets, it's not fully plumbed through IPv6. There's no technical reason why not, other than there was an IPv4 requirement. This is one of those examples of, you know, this was a scratch the itch project that had an IPv4 requirement and then a requirement to get passive receive working. So plumbing everything through IPv6 for promiscuous sockets is lower on the list. But if you actually look at the code, it's, it's partially done. It, you just have to replicate exactly what's going on on IPv4 side into some of the, the six specific you know, equivalent functions. But there's technically nothing new going on. It's just code that has to be written. Um, currently, the, the TCP IP code in there is 9.1. So you know, near-term effort we're looking at maybe over the summer is to upgrade that to uh, 10 series um, to get some of the improvements that have happened since 9.1. And that's probably all its interest. And a couple of quick acknowledgments. Of course, to Julie Mallet, um, who was really persistent connecting me to this work. Uh, good sounding board throughout, and certainly suffered through the first LibUI integration with WAM proxy. Um, and of course, to, to the sponsors who paid for all this, uh, all of whom wish to be named are listed on the slide. If you click on their logo, it'll take you to their websites. For some reason, nobody wants to talk about work like this. The good news is it's, um, it's open source. So we can, we can talk about the details. Uh, I think it's the same old story. For some reason, the, uh, the source code is perceived to have no marketing value. You know what the use of it is. So we can talk about the source code all day and night, but nobody wants to advertise what they're building yet, right? And uh, this was a, a nice uh, Canadian scene from west of town, uh, well, Vancouver Island. Um, but I think we've covered the Q&A and ran out of time, so 
All right. Well, thanks for sticking around, guys. Sorry I ran over. And these will, this, this stack will get posted. Um, there'll be a link to another speaker page at some point.